Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday live stream. So this is a good one. This was a uh, it was an interesting interview. And this is on CNBC. And what I liked about this one, it, it kind of pulled back the curtain as to just not the ETFs, but what's going on behind the scenes of the ETFs. We're going to take a look at uh, what's the percentage of, uh, of retail versus investors coming in, how much it's actually accelerating, the kind of warnings that Gary Gensler has been giving. And then uh, we'll just talk about shorting the market, which me personally, I'm not a big fan of, but what are you going to do? So uh, this right here, this was uh, a clip again from CNBC. This is uh, the chief investment officer, Matt Hogan, and he is from Bitwise. And Bitwise is uh, one of the numerous spot Bitcoin ETFs, and they're pretty much right in the middle as far as like assets. I mean, they're not the huge black rock or gray scale, but they're not really down the dumps as far as like Wisdom Tree and Franklin Templeton. Uh, they've got quite a bit of uh, skin in the game. So I like to, to hear about what's going on and let's just uh, take a listen. So before we do that, let me uh, first say thanks everybody for stopping by. It's always nice. But uh, let's make sure you can hear this perfectly. And uh, we're gonna go over four or five different uh, snippets or clips here. And um, I'll start right here. It's hard, of course, Bob, to get a precise feel for retail versus institutional. But I can say at Bitwise, what we're seeing in BITB is a large number of types of investors allocating. We're definitely seeing retail investors allocating, you know, self-directed individuals. But we have an increasing number of registered investment advisors who are allocating into our fund. We're having hedge funds allocating into our fund. BITB is being bought by venture capital funds and others. And I think we're gonna see some other major unlocks in the future. So I can't give you percentages on retail versus professional. I know a lot of people wish we could, but of course an ETF's that difficult, but we can tell you for sure that there are a significant number of professional investors buying millions and tens of millions of dollars of BITB and I assume other ETFs as well. So it's, it's both markets right now. Great. So if anybody out there is saying, ah, you know what, uh, we know exactly how much is actually happening. We see that there's a massive amount of institutions. Uh, you just heard from the CIO of one of the, again, the largest spot Bitcoin ETFs. And he's pretty much telling you, he's like, look, we've got a lot of people coming in. I can't tell you exactly what it is. We think it's this, but it could be something else. So it's one of those things where you have to just say, okay, we, we know things are accelerating. It sounds pretty good. But as far as like the exact percentages, we don't really know. And then this next piece, he's going to talk about uh, wirehouses and how things are actually moving. And when we're talking about this, I need to I need you to kind of understand what he's talking about because not everybody knows that. So we take a look here. What are wirehouses? Uh, this would be uh, like the investment advisors, financial planning, retirement planning, estate planning, investment products and investment research. And there's, there's a whole host of different organizations and hedge funds that will actually help you with that. But when he talks about wirehouse services, it was interesting to note just how far along they are and just how much they're actually uh, accelerating. And that's where we talked about as far as like with the uh, thumbnail and the title itself of this video, because when we hear about these things and we know things are doing quite well, we see number go up, everybody's happy, but just how much is it and how much is on the back end? Because that's great that we're doing, you know, fantastic things right now. And we're seeing a, a massive push into it, but is that it? Or is there another pump behind the pump? And I think that's just something uh, important to take a look at. So again, just take a listen to this. This is about a minute or so about how things are accelerating and kind of makes you bullish, but Take it with a grain of salt, and we'll talk about uh, the next piece in just a second. Uh, institutional acceptance or resistance are we seeing? I mean, uh, the wirehouses, for example, is Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan. Do they allow it in their in their on their trading platforms? I think what we're seeing is different parts of the institutional community reacting with different levels of speed. So registered investment advisors, independent FAs could buy it on day one and they were buying it. Hedge funds could buy it on day one and they were buying it. As you go up the chain to wirehouses or pensions or endowments, they have their own due diligence processes that takes weeks, months, sometimes quarters, sometimes even years. But I will say that from the day these launched to today, that process has moved faster than I expected. At first people were saying it could take a year then it could take half a year, then it could take a quarter, then it was a few months. 
and we keep getting calls every day. Can we talk today? Can we talk tomorrow? We have to accelerate this thing. So the wirehouses are still coming. Most advisors can't buy it on a solicited basis there, but they're going to turn on, I believe, soon. Eventually, everyone will be able to access these ETFs, and uh, that'll be great for flows. I think it'll mean another uptick for flows in the future. So so, okay. So before we get on to the, to the next piece, um, and we're going to talk about shorting, which, <laughs> hey, I've had at it, right? But uh, it's interesting that, he, you know, he talks about, he's like, you know, we, we're seeing accelerating people really coming in, but does that mean that we're going to go in a straight line straight up? No. I don't know what the price is right now today. I mean, in the morning, it looks pretty good, 71, 72. It doesn't mean it can't go down. And of course, when we hear about like all this hopium, you know, we, we, we tune in, we watch these YouTube videos, we get super excited, and then we're like, what happened to the price? This is not a thing that just goes over you know, from one night to the next and we have this uh, this green God candle. So I think there's people in the trenches behind the scenes that are going, okay, we want to get in. We really do. We're trying to accelerate it. But for the legal aspects and everything we have to do as far as due diligence and dot our, dot our I's and cross our T's, it's going to take a little bit of time. We're trying to accelerate as much as possible, but we're not there yet. But it is quite a bullish sentiment. So now the next piece, uh, we're going to talk about shorting because there's always another side to this. So for every peop every individual, every institution that's buying, there's another side of people who want to sell, who want to short, and that's just the way it is. There's nothing to get wrong with that. You know, this is a free market. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. So right now we're going to take a listen. Uh, this is <clears throat> Simeon Hyman, and he's the uh, head of uh, ProShares. He's going to talk about uh, shorting. And when he talks about shorting, just listen to how calm he is when he's talking about it. It was quite surprising. Then I kind of figured out, I'm like, oh, that makes total sense. So just take a listen here. Simeon, um, you the only one that's got a short Bitcoin product <laughs> uh, out there. Those of you who, who don't know, uh, put up the Simeon short Bitcoin uh, ETF. Uh, when Bitcoin hit a new high last week, uh, the short Bitcoin ETF, yours, hit a record in trading volume. That was interesting to me. And both the Bitcoin futures ETF and the short Bitcoin futures have had strong inflows this year. So your business, which is the that that the futures business, isn't it seems only be strengthened by this. Uh, we we uh, to quote Mark Twain, the uh, reports of our death have been quite exaggerated. Bitto on the long side has prospered four hundred million dollars of inflows this year. And we think it's a part a testament to the efficacy of the futures approach. You know, our premium to discount to NAV it's de minimis, and there's still a gap there in the spot folks that have launched. So a very important attribute there, uh, strong, strong flows. And of course, you mentioned the short side. So BITI seeing flows as well. And we're happy to be here. And we think we're serving as a, as a key alternative. And I'll, I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> so yeah. So do you see how like just nonchalant is like, yeah, we're shorting, we're doing this, we're, we're allowing it. And that's fine. That's really what it is. But I want you to notice that of course, when you have something like that and people are saying, ah, you know, just going short, I don't know how much skin he's got in the game, but I'm pretty sure that he's going to charge some fees for that. And if his clients are like, hey, it didn't work out for me because I shorted, you're like, well, that's just uh, un unfortunately a little bit too bad. And uh, that's how essentially the whole market goes. So if you're into shorting and you listen to people who say to short and you do that and it doesn't work out, it's not on them, it's on you. So then the last couple of pieces, I think this is important and it's important because we're in the trenches all the time, right? We've been here for quite quite a, uh, a span of, uh, of time itself, especially through the bear market. Now we're going to the bull market. So things that we talk about are second nature and we sometimes forget about the people that are, try are just getting in right now. And some of these things just kind of go over their head. So again, um, let's take a listen here. Uh, this is going to be Matt Hogan. He's going to talk about the having, And uh, what I want to talk about after he gets done is just how important it is to kind of explain this to people because I'm going to share an example of a friend that actually contacted me and said, hey, there's this having going on. So does that mean that half of my Bitcoin's gone? I'm like, no, that's not how it works. So anyhow, just take a listen to this. And again, I think this is another, another aspect to the whole part as far as uh, the acceleration. You mentioned the having is coming up in April. What the halving is, is when the amount of new Bitcoin produced each day falls in half. Right now, Bitcoin creates about 900 Bitcoin a day. And after April, it's only going to be about 450. A way for you know listeners to think about that is the total amount of new supply of Bitcoin coming into the market 
will shrink by about $10 billion a year starting in April. What's driving the Bitcoin market right now is a simple demand supply imbalance. We have this huge new source of demand from these ETFs and we have supply that's inelastic. And actually in April, that new supply is going to fall in half. That means you know, if these things stay the same, the price has to adjust upwards until we unlock yeah. some long-term holders who are willing to sell. Well, this yeah, so, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? We all know this about the halving. It's all great. It's all good. Just remember that uh, the people that are going to talk to you and be like, hey, what about this halving and how does this all work? Just remind them to make this as super simple as you possibly can. Just remind them that we haven't mined all the Bitcoin. Right now we've mined approximately, this is from buybitcoinworldwide.com, total Bitcoin in existence. Actually, it should say mined, but I guess it's in existence because you can actually trade it. It hasn't been mined yet. It is 19,652,381, just, just 19 and a half million. So I got to remember, right? 93% of Bitcoins have been issued. We still got 1.3 Bitcoins left to be mined. There's 900 Bitcoins being produced per day by the miners on April 20th, roughly it'll be 450. And then when people are going to ask you like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I'm not going to lose half my Bitcoin. No, it's just that the miners, they're going to do the same amount of work and they'll get half pay, which is crazy, but that's just how it works. The thing I want you to remind them is that is this. When will the last Bitcoin be mined? It'll be sometime in the year 2140. <laughs> so uh, when people are asking you the question of like, well, how long is this going to take? It's going to take a long time. And uh, that's just something to remind people. I know we know it, but it's important that they understand it. And the last piece, kind of reluctant to talk about this, but this was a warning from Gary Gensler. And of course, we're always talking about regulation and how things are going. Unfortunately, the SEC has been pretty, pretty poor as far as their win ratio uh, for enforcement through regulation, but it is what it is. So again, uh, what we're going to hear is uh, Matt's going to talk about what he has heard from Gary Gensler and how this is going to affect the clients and the investment advisors and everybody else. So just take a listen to this last piece and then we'll uh, move on from there. So this will be it uh, ba, 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 right around here. So you're sitting there. Uh, it's hard to get on Morgan Stanley's platform or JP Morgan. You know, there is requirements. And among them, what you mentioned is word due diligence. But one of the things I keep hearing when I talk to RIAs is the suitability concern. Uh, Gensler fired a shot at all of the investment community when he conceded they had lost on the Bitcoin debate, but said, may I remind everybody that under Reg Best Interest, Reg BI, you have suitability requirements. You can't give Bitcoin to grandma if it's not suitable for grandma to have Bitcoin. And he, he suddenly implied, not suddenly, subtly implied, uh, that they could be open to lawsuits at all. It, I'm sure this is part of that, that suitability. The, is the industry out trying to figure out what the legal standards are at this point for, suit, for suitability? That seems to be a critical issue. Well, the good news there, Bob, is that advisors have been doing this for years. Here at Bitwise, we've been serving financial advisors, helping them access Bitcoin and other crypto assets for more than seven years. So there are well-established ways to solve that suitability question. As you mentioned, Bitcoin may not be for everyone. It's a very volatile asset. It moves around a lot. Some people find it difficult to understand. But for advisors who understand it, who study the market, who know their clients, who understand the risks and opportunities and can document that, then they can find a way to solve for that problem. Again, they've been doing it for years. But that's part and parcel of that due diligence. There's also due diligence on the funds themselves, on the custodians they use, on the liquidity ecosystem. But importantly, this is the same for every asset. It's just this is opening up a new asset class. And so we're having to do it. The good news is people are doing it quickly. Yeah. And well said. So, yeah, you're going to hear those types of things. Gary Gens is going to be trotted out in all the different uh, shows and talk about how dangerous it is. And he said it. And, it, and actually, he's, he's right. It is a little risky. And it is volatile. He's 100% correct. But when he goes out and says like, you know, really people should have to do their due diligence. It's so risky and we don't think this is right for grandma and da 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 da. It kind of makes people a little bit hesitant. And of course, you know, Matt told you right there, he's like, look, there's a reason why the real estate investment or uh, investment advisors, because they have to go through a long process and they have to tell everybody the risks and they have to use the different disclaimers, which the SEC has put forth. He goes, so we're doing our job, Gary. Essentially what he should have said is we're doing our job, Gary, please do yours. But uh, that's neither here nor there. So anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. 
And it's not all great news, I think. Although there is this one last piece that is pretty great. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, uh, go or Bitcoin just crossed over market cap for silver. So it is in the number eight spot. I think it was the last uh, couple of days or so. And look, it's roughly, it's almost exactly 10% of uh, gold's market cap. And if you heard the, uh, the clip we, we played yesterday, we talked about the difference between gold and Bitcoin. You can understand just how fast it'll actually eat into gold's market cap. And I'm, I remember when I got in 2017, people were talking about this and they're like, yeah, maybe you can get 5%, maybe 7 maybe 10%, ah, maybe 10%. And here we are, and we're not even at the halving. So I think that's more bullishness. Also on top of this bullishness, Thailand. Not that this is a big story. It's not like Thailand has you know a massive amount of billionaires, but I could be wrong. Thailand's SEC, Green Lights Investment Funds, uh, from institutional wealthy individuals in crypto. Earlier this year, the regulator denied permission to trade Bitcoin ETFs. Thailand's SEC has made an exception. I hate this rule. Essentially, it's if you've made money, you can make more money. That's accredited investors, essentially. It allows inst institutional investors and very high net worth individuals to invest in crypto exchange traded funds. And that's about it. Again, if you don't meet that criteria, sorry, Charlie, you can't make anything. But of course, it's risky, right? It's risky. So I just thought it was just a, a nice little article to talk a little bit more bullishness, but it's not all great. CPI. So inflation numbers came out. Interesting. And uh, for some reason, the economists keep getting it wrong. We thought we'd be at 3.1% and it outpaced that. It's now 3.2%. Remember, this is year over year. We're still increasing in inflation. Yes, it is coming down, but we're still going up. They were thinking 3.1, now it's 3.2. I don't know what the traditional markets are, but probably losing their minds because, you know, 0.1% is crazy. But uh, this is just what it is. Stubbornly high inflation so far in 2024. And of course, I know people were talking about, well, you know, Jerome Powell and the Fed, they're going to definitely uh, lower the rates. And uh, no, that's not going to happen probably in the next FOMC meeting. They'll probably stay higher for longer, like they, like they've always said. They could, they could lower it, but now with this with this report, don't expect any rate cuts anytime soon. And then, just as a reminder, let me just steal Ben's information. Uh, he won't mind. And uh, we can see here that as far as CPI numbers year over year, we were at uh, three point one in January, and now we're at a crazy wacky three point one seven, rounded up to three point two. So. People might be losing their mind, and and that's what it is. But yeah, you don't, you, we can't discount the macro. These are the things we should be looking at because you know when the macro is strong and the traditional markets are strong, uh, then of course our market is strong. But that's not always going to be correlated like that. We'll see how long it lasts. But anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then last things, there's some vibes coming out that kind of makes me feel like 2021 vibes. This is from Crypto T. She says that Drake posted the Michael Saylor Bitcoin video on his Instagram story. Drake, the famous rapper, has a, over 180 million people on Instagram. So this will just expose them to it. And I got to tell you, once we start getting uh, these celebrities coming in, it's not a great sign, but we'll see how it works out. And then also some more vibes, even Jamie Dimon saying, hey, he'll defend your right to buy Bitcoin. Now, before you go crazy, uh, it's not that big of a deal. This was on a conference and he said, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Dimon says, look, I defend your right to smoke a cigarette. I'll defend your right to buy a Bitcoin. However, he added that he would personally never buy Bitcoin. I do think it's a risk if you're a buyer when governments look at this stuff, why do they even put up with it? Great question. And we talked about this with Donald Trump yesterday is he's actually softened on Bitcoin. So who knows what Jamie Dimon's thinking, but that's it for today. So look, if you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. I tried not to do too much hopium because look, we don't know where things are going. It looks good, but remember, I've been here since 2017. Bitcoin was supposed to go to a million back then. 2021, Bitcoin was supposed to go to a million back then too. And now here we are in 2024 and I keep hearing the same thing. Super cycle and community and diamond hands and million, blah, blah, blah. We'll see. I just, uh, just be careful out there because things are looking pretty good, but you never know. 